So I think we're going to get going again. What a great conference this has been. Fabulous. And we're going to shift gears now a little bit to looking at the environmental issues um, that arise from CAFOs. And I'm Wendy Jacobs. I run our environmental law and policy clinic and teach environmental law here. And I just, we're, we're really fortunate to have three terrific presenters for this panel. So I'm going to quickly introduce them and ask you again to hold questions till the end. We're going to save plenty of time for questions. So first up will be Eric Olson who is the Senior Strategic Director for Health and Food at NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. He's already had a shout out today. Eric is going to give us an overview of the legal framework and some of the problems regulating CAFOs. Then Greg Dane, who's a Senior Assistant Regional Counsel with EPA Region 1 here in Boston, will speak about several enforcement initiatives that are underway in Region 1. And then finally, we've got Matt Hayek, who's a PhD candidate in environmental science and engineering right here at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And Matt's going to talk about the relationship between CAFOs and greenhouse gas emissions, which is really interesting. So again, we're going to reserve time for questions and turn it over to Eric. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I just wanted to start out by asking a question, which is, how many of you have ever been to a CAFO or a slaughterhouse? OK, a few of you. Um, it is an experience. And um, it's actually something that I would recommend to anyone, especially anyone who eats meat or anybody who doesn't. Um, it's, it's a good way to learn what the real world is all about. Um, and there, it's not always easy to get in, but it's, a, it's something that I would certainly recommend to people. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is um, sort of the legal framework for um, regulating CAFOs to the extent there is one. Um, and I'll talk a bit about some of the litigation, but I really, since I'm going to give a very quick overview, I'm not going to have time to really get into any of the details, although I'm happy to chat with people afterwards or take a few questions. Um, most of you probably know of NRDC. We're an organization with about 1.4 million members and ad advocates that are part of our organization, about 450 staff people. Um, we have a fairly large um, program on agriculture and food, um, which I hope to oversee. I recently came from Pew. Actually, I was um, the head of food programs at Pew until about four months ago. Um, and I had been at, uh, in the Senate. And, um, prior to that at NRDC for about 15 years as a litigator and lobbyist. Um, so what are the harms that I'm going to talk about just briefly? Um, obviously, we've heard a little bit about antibiotic overuse. Um, I'll briefly touch on that. Bob did a great job of um, going into some depth on that. Some of the water quality, air quality, GHG being greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll just touch on some of the soil degradation issues. Um, this, I think, is an amazing um, graphic. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but what it says uh, that dark spot in the middle is humans. This is basically the mass of animals on land in the world. Um, that big dark spot is humans. This huge swath over here is cattle. Um, those are pigs in the upper right hand corner, goats to the right, lower right hand corner, sheep, horses, elephants are one dot. Um, all the green on the entire chart are wild animals. It absolutely blew me away when I saw this because what that tells you is how much we've changed the earth. I mean, if you look at that, the, it's almost trivial how much um, biomass is left of wild animals. It's been completely swamped by domesticated animals. Um, and the laws have been very slow to, adopt, uh, to adapt, and I will, I'll quote the Congressional Research Service, which, as you know, is a pretty nonpartisan group. Um, one of their recent, uh, more uh, comprehensive reports on this issue said, agriculture is, quote, virtually unregulated by the expansive body of environmental law that has developed in the, pa in the United States over the past 30 years. And I think that's a fair summary. It's not, they're not saying that there's, it doesn't touch at all upon um, CAFOs or on agriculture, 
but there are an awful lot of exemptions. And I'm not going to do justice to all the exemptions. I'm just going to touch on them. Um, as we heard, 70 to 80 percent of antibiotics used, are used in ag agriculture, and there are huge concerns about antibiotic resistance. Um, one issue is these, the national, um, there's a study that goes on that's regularly testing for antibiotic resistance, the National Antibiotic Resistant Monitoring System, um, which tests bacteria in food animals. They're seeing a ever steady increase in antibiotic resistance in many of the animals that they test. Um, Consumer Reports recently did a major study that Pew funded on chicken showing widespread contamination with salmonella and other antibiotic resistant, multi-drug resistant bacteria, um, as well as academic studies that show the same thing. Um, Bob touched on this. Um, actually, the cover story in NRDC's magazine this, this uh, quarter is on this issue, um, but particularly um, FDA's findings in the 1970s um, as Bob mentioned, we filed litigation. It's, um, we won in the district court in New York, and we're now up in the Second Circuit. The case was argued um, in January of last year. Um, we haven't gotten an opinion back from the Court of Appeals yet, um, but we're hopeful and optimistic if that, actually, if that case is upheld, it um, could really foreshadow major changes in regulation of antibiotics in animal agriculture. Um, as has been mentioned, FDA has responded with a voluntary guidance, um, which in our view, although it, it raises the issue, do, is not going to solve the problem. Um, food pathogens, um, for those of you who don't know this, um, the numbers are pretty staggering. One in six of us gets sick every year from foodborne illness, 48 million people, 128,000 are hospitalized, and about 3,000 die. And we're seeing this increase in antibiotic resistance. So let's talk about the environmental impacts aside from those antibiotic-related ones. Um, one is manure. Um, the numbers are really kind of hard to even wrap your mind around. Um, by a low-end estimate from USDA, 335 million tons dry of animal waste is generated every year. 335 million tons. Um, Pew's estimate was 1.7 billion tons of total wet solid animal waste. Um, those numbers kind of sound big, they are. Um, that's 10 to more than 100 times the amount of human waste. Um, just think about that. All those sewage treatment plants that we all drive by, um, those basically are trivial in the amount of waste that they handle compared to the animal infrastructure. And that first chart that I showed you really tells you why. The other statistic Bob mentioned that hogs um, generate per pound far more waste than humans do um, is also an interesting statistic. And this one, I think, goes to the antitrust issue that Bob raised. 2% of the factory farms produce 40% of the solid waste. What does that tell you? It tells you that there are a handful of these massive animal feeding operations that generate huge amounts of waste. Um, and this is just one state that happens to collect this data fairly well, um, Iowa where the Iowa DNR, Department of Natural Resources, does collect data on animal feeding operations and spills of manure. Um, so the bigger dots are four spills, the littler dots are one spill, and then the red dots, if you can see this, are non-permitted confinements, as they call them. In other words, these are guys that aren't covered by the regulatory infrastructure. A lot of them have had spills and they are just across the state of Iowa. So Iowa is hog country these days. It is a massive number of CAFOs. A lot of that is now being exported to China um, in the form of spam, among other things. Um, so what are the environmental impacts of all these spills and the leaching and so on? I mean, obviously, there's local and regional surface water contamination, a lot of groundwater contamination with nitrates um, as a result of the manure pathogens. And we see a lot of eutrophication, meaning basically um, when the, there's a bloom of um, microorganisms um, in the water, um, they die off, they kill all, basically consume all the oxygen, creates dead zones. There's a dead zone that varies in size in the, at the bottom of the Mississippi River around the size of New Jersey um, that's largely dead of any fish as a result of runoff of manure and um, obviously also um, inorganic fertilizer use. 
Um, Clean Water Act gaps in coverage. Now, I, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail because I know Greg is going to talk about this a bit. Um, some of the large CAFOs, the uh, concentrated animal feeding operations or factory farms, are covered by discharge permits, but a whole lot of them are not. Um, Bob gave you some of the statistics. Um, there are a lot of CAFOs that are not covered by um, Clean Water Act permits. Um, certain agricultural stormwater discharges are also um, exempt. In fact, most of them are. Um, the Clean Water Act rules, I'm not going to go through the litany of the litigation because that would be an entire um, seminar I think you could give just on that. But EPA did revise the rules in 2003 for Clean Water Act. Um, I assume Greg is going to get into some of these court decisions, um, but there were a couple of major court decisions, second and fifth circuits. Um, EPA responded with rules to respond to the remands. Um, as was mentioned, the inventory, we don't have a very good inventory um, that is accessible to the public, um, and we've got massive issues continuing with land application, groundwater largely being address, unaddressed. And um, in some states, there have been petitions to withdraw the state's authority to implement the Clean Water Act, um, which have started things moving forward in some cases. Um, other exemptions that I'll just mention, um, RICRA, this Resource Conservation Recovery Act, has an exemption for animal manure application. The Superfund law has an exemption that's similar. Um, there's possibility of litigation uh, of um, liability for spills, unintentional or otherwise. Um, but there's also been a lot of congressional uh, interest in potentially cutting off any such liability. Air pollution, another major um, issue with a lot of these animal feeding operations, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, particulates, obviously the odor being a problem. Clean Air Act has rarely been used. As, um, we're familiar, we have a lawyer on our team that's done some Clean Air Act um, work to try to get farms, uh, or try to get these factory farms covered, but most of them are not. Um, and there's also a possibility of the uh, Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act or CERCLA applying. Um, this is a kind of an amazing infographic also. This tells you for greenhouse gas emissions how much difference there is between different sources of your protein. So this um, is a fact sheet on the NRDC's website, but um, look at beef compared to pork, compared to chicken, compared to um, protein sources or uh, other food sources. Beef is just so much higher, largely because they're ruminants and they release a lot of methane. Um, factory farm emissions are enormous, um, as are overall emissions from cattle. Um, better beef is possible with better grazing. Um, the top is bad grazing, the bottom is better grazing. You can actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions about 20% with better grazing. Um, but there's a, a lot of debate, and we'll hear about this on how you fix this problem. Huge resource consumption. Um, in the agricultural sector. Um, but overall, the conclusions are that, obviously, the environmental laws, and this has just been a, an inch deep, really don't touch on most of the major emissions and problems from large animal feeding operations. There are a lot of gaps, significant public health and environmental risks that aren't addressed. And as we see the rising consumption, not domestically, but overseas and a lot of exports, there are going to be huge challenges. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Dane. Um, as Wendy said, I work at the EPA as an attorney. Um, I think it's been about 25 years since I've been in this room. It looks sort of the same except for the microphones, but I think I feel a little bit more relaxed as compared to how I felt then. Um, anyway, so I, I've worked on a lot of different things at EPA over these years, and recently I've had some specific experience with um, CAFO regulation under the Clean Water Act and, you know, a couple of basic points uh, that people probably know um, are the Clean Water Act prohibits discharges of pollutants from point sources to waters of the United States. CAFOs are specifically um, included within the definition of point source in the statute. Um, EPA's regulations have divided uh, concentrated animal feeding operations into large, medium, and small based on the numbers of animals and sort of the um, uh, uh, hydrologic conditions around the sites um, sometimes uh, play a part in the definition. 
Oh, okay, sorry, I'll speak louder. Um, so just a couple of factual pieces of information. I, I noticed that one of the things Eric said is that the inventories we have about how many CAFOs there are aren't terribly good, and I don't know exactly that these um, numbers that I'm about to say are uh, quality assured, but they're the best numbers I could come up with from some enforcement folks that work in my office. And uh, from reports we get from states, there are apparently large, uh, nine large farms in Connecticut, 34 medium farms, and about 250 small farms. Um, and obviously there are different animal thresholds that define these different sizes. Um, in Maine, apparently there are about 10 large farms, 38 medium farms, and about 165 small farms. In Massachusetts, there are four large CAFOs, one of which is not really a farm, it's Suffolk Downs Racetrack, um, which is a CAFO. Um, and I'll mention something that EPA Region 1 did um, with the racetrack recently and is still doing. Um, uh, so there are four large ones in Massachusetts, 24 medium farms, and we don't have information on how many small ones there are. I don't know why <laughs> we don't. Um, New Hampshire apparently has one large farm, less than 20 medium farms, and again, uh, the number of small farms is unknown. Rhode Island reports that it has no farms whatsoever that meet any of these definitions. I'm not surprised Rhode Island <laughs> said something like that, excuse me if any. Um, uh, and Vermont apparently has about 17 large farms, 150 medium farms, and again, we, we don't know the number of small farms. Um, so basically, EPA's regulatory scheme um, consists of technology-based standards that, you know, simply put, um, are implemented to control um, the process wastewater, um, any water that reaches the site that comes into contact with manure and litter and the animals themselves and the bedding and so forth and the feed. Um, and then there are uh, water quality standards that um, apply under the Clean Water Act in certain bodies of water that have to be complied with when uh, discharge permits are issued. Uh, so when EPA and states issue um, permits under the Clean Water Act to these CAFOs, um, these permits are supposed to include uh, technology-based standards that are set forth in the regulations or that are developed as a, a, a result of a permit writer's so-called best professional judgment um, for the uh, non-large ones. For the large size farms, there are specific national effluent limitations guidelines that spell out the kinds of structures, and sometimes they're referred to as uh, best management practices or BMPs that have to be implemented to ensure there aren't um, releases of um, nutrients and pollutants um, from the process wastewater into waters of the United States. Um, and water quality standards limitations are included in permits if the technology-based standards are not sufficient um, to protect the water quality standards that are set for the waters to which the CAFO is discharging. Um, so you may or may not have a different set of water quality-based uh, limits in those permits. Um, the one of the major aspects of EPA's regulations um, involves what's called a nutrient management plan, and um, the, there are nine minimum requirements of such plans, and I'll just mention them quickly. One, one is obviously uh, structures have to be built, retention structures or storage structures have to be built um, to adequately accommodate um, any precipitation that would um, end up hitting the manure, litter, animals, et cetera, and would then run off the site. Um, animal mortalities have to be handled in an appropriate way so that um, none, none of those animals uh, are disposed of in water, obviously, or are located um, after they've died on the site in such a way that um, rainwater would um, come into contact with them and then ultimately reach waters of the United States. Um, Clean water um, that might hit roofs um, uh, of buildings that are on the site are required to be diverted away from the so-called production area where the animals are so that you minimize the amount of water that actually comes into contact with things that would result in discharges of pollutants. Um, uh, animals have to uh, 
the, the CAFO owner operator has to ensure that animals do not come into contact with water. Um, chemicals managed at the site must be managed in a way that they don't end up in the um, wastewater retention structures, of course. Um, various conservation practices like buffers um, around the edges of the site are required to minimize the possibility of releases of processed wastewater that includes pollutants into waters of the United States that might be near the CAFO. Um, there are um, test protocols required for um, manure, litter, processed wastewater, and soil. Um, another big aspect of the regulations has to do with um, what's called land application of manure and processed wastewater. So um, there are two essential pieces of a CAFO as EPA's regulations are structured. One is the production area where the animals are kept. Another might be a at the CAFO owner's um, choice, um, what's called a land application area where um, a nutrient management plan must include protocols and measures designed to ensure that nutrients in any of the manure or wastewater, processed wastewater, are efficiently used such that, um, you know, it, it ensures gr the growing of crops but at the same time isn't applied too heavily so that there are then discharges from the land application area into waters of the United States. And one of the stormwater exemptions, agricultural stormwater exemptions that I think Eric was alluding to, um, uh, is defined in these CAFO regs as um, if, if a discharge from land applying manure or wastewater occurs and the, the manure and wastewater was not applied in such a way as to efficiently use the nutrients I in the waste, um, such that there isn't excess um, nutrients that would flow into the waters, then there's an exemption if there happens to be some discharge from that area. Um, but the burden would be on the um, CAFO owner to show that the uh, processed wastewater and manure was applied consistent with a lot of detailed um, agricultural protocols for um, efficiently using uh, the nutrients. I have two minutes, okay. Um, I don't need much more. So anyway, those are the basic aspects of the so-called nutrient management plan, which is a big aspect of EPA's regs. And then, as Eric alluded to, in 2005, the Second Circuit um, uh, issued an important opinion which uh, limited the scope of EPA's regs. Basically, permits were required not only of CAFOs that actually discharged, in other words, where there was evidence there was an actual discharge to a water of the United States, but also for those um, that potentially would discharge. And I think the way it operated was you were presumed to potentially discharge or have a potential to discharge unless you could demonstrate affirmatively um, by making a demonstration that there was no way you would. And then, so EPA, in response to that case, changed its regs to say, okay, we won't say proposed to discharge, uh, potential to discharge, we'll say proposed to discharge, which, having worked at EPA for a long time, makes me smile. But um, we, uh, we also, uh, there was a Fifth Circuit opinion in 2011 which rejected that concept as well. So what we're left with essentially is a situation where unless EPA can actually document an actual discharge, which means that we have to be out all over the place actually seeing it happen when it occurs for much of the time, unless you have a good circumstantial um, set of facts, um, means that enforcement is very difficult. And so the, the two cases I'll just mention that I'm, I'm aware of that EPA's um, been involved with recently involve an enforcement action that was taken against Suffolk Downs because um, process wastewater and manure and such um, had been released from Suffolk Downs into Sales Creek, um, which is a sensitive water body out in that area, as I understand it, for about 40 years without a permit. So that's discharging without a permit for 40 years in violation of the Clean Water Act. And they've constructed an, an immense retention structure now um, and uh, the other one I'll mention quickly, just because I've run out of time, sorry, is um, CLF filed a petition with EPA a few years ago asking EPA to withdraw its authorization that we gave to Vermont to implement the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permits Program, the Clean Water Act Permits Program, um, be because, among other things, the state wasn't adequately permitting CAFOs. And so we worked on a, a, a general permit 
that would apply to all medium-sized CAFOs um, in Vermont that Vermont did ultimately issue in final form and was um, part of the uh, settlement terms between CLF and EPA. And uh, I believe the petition's been resolved based on that and other measures that were undertaken. So that's it. Um, so while he's setting this up, I just want to take a second to thank the organizers for asking me to come to this, specifically um, Alicia, Aline, Aaron, and Wendy, who invited me on here and did some great organizing for this panel to happen. Uh, so um, Eric presented you with kind of a large overview of a lot of the environmental impacts and some of the, some of the efforts to, uh, some of the efforts to avoid or even litigate against them. Uh, Greg did, I think, a fantastic job going specifically into some of these water issues. And what I'd like to do um, is, let's go back to the beginning here, is uh, give you an, a, a, is to hone in specifically on some of the air quality issues, specifically regarding greenhouse gases, which I focus on and other members of my group focus on measuring. I'm gonna be presenting other people's work and not my own here. Uh, just to make that clear, I want to present an overview of the greenhouse gases that come from livestock because there's a lot of confusion about where in the livestock sector a lot of these greenhouse gases can come from and this can potentially misguide some of the efforts in order to mitigate them. So what I want to do is demystify these emissions, the specific greenhouse gases that come from livestock and their specific sources within the livestock sector. And a lot of you may have seen this number before. I believe it's the best one out there. And it's that about 18% of all greenhouse gases come from livestock. If you add up all the transportation vehicles, all the cars, trains, uh, buses, planes, trucks, that number for greenhouse gases comes to only about 16%. What's important to keep in mind in keeping with you know, accuracy and precision is that this is not the most precise number. It's really hard to do these bottom-up estimates and life cycle analyses. And this, was, this number was done by the United Nations, who keeps some of the most comprehensive numbers of worldwide livestock uh, in the world and then multiplied their inventories by the amount of greenhouse gases that animals in different sectors and different countries raised in different ways tend to produce. So e there's considerable uncertainty in this number, but even if you were to take it as a ballpark, it's still alarming. And uh, you know, vehicle emissions have already been tackled in some ways through lit litigation, executive orders, um, or legislation and executive orders, and there's been a lot of initiative to reduce emissions from the transportation sector. This number, I think, is sufficient reason in order to worry about mitigating emissions from the livestock sector. And to clarify specifically what these greenhouse gases are, I have this table here, and on the left-hand side of the column, you can see the three major greenhouse gases. These are ranked in order, not, in, not only in order that they contribute to global warming, but specifically in order that they actually come from uh, the livestock sector or animal agriculture in particular. Um, for those of you who know about radiating, radiative forcing or uh, greenhouse or global warming potential, these numbers and the numbers in the rest of the talk are going to be scaled by the amount of net contribution they make to global warming. So some of you may know that methane is actually molecule for molecule, 30 times more potent at causing greenhouse, uh, at causing global warming, but there's a lot less of it in the atmosphere. And nitrous oxide is 300 more times potent times more potent than carbon dioxide, but there is even way less of it in the atmosphere. There's only about a one thousandth of it that there is of carbon dioxide. So uh, on the right of this table, you can actually see the major source in the livestock sector, or the sources in the livestock sector that uh, these greenhouse gases come from. And in bold, up at the top of each cell, is the biggest source in the livestock sector of these greenhouse gases. So for example, deforestation is the major source of carbon dioxide in, in, in animal agriculture. Um, so uh, clear cutting for pasture and some, some of this deforestation, come, or most of this deforestation rather, comes from clear cutting pasture and some of it is also for used for uh, providing feed crops for animals in industrial operations. 
Uh, as one example, out of all Amazon deforestation, beef is expanding rapidly in the Amazon. About 80% of cattle pasture in the last decade, uh, or about 80% of all deforestation was from expanding pasture for grazing cattle. And to put that number in perspective, that's about the size of the state of Vermont once every two years deforested in the Amazon to make way for cattle pasture alone. And so the next, uh, the next entry here on the uh, table is methane. And the biggest source of that is fermentation from inside cow's stomach that comes out mostly from belches, also a little bit of flatulence. Uh, that has to do with the bacteria actually decomposing their feed and being belched out as methane. And to a lesser extent, it's manure management. When you pile up methane in these big lagoons and it can't get oxygen, uh, a lot of the carbon, instead of coming out as carbon dioxide, comes out as methane, which is more potent in terms of causing global warming. And the last entry here is nitrous oxide. And the biggest source of it, uh, by far, is manure, and a little bit less of it is from decomposing fertilizer on the fields that are raising the feed crop. So these are the sources that come out of that Livestock's Long Shadow report from the United Nations. It's the most comprehensive life cycle analysis done up to this point. And uh, it's I think a really important takeaway from this slide here and this report is that most of these emissions, most of the biggest emissions, don't go away when you de-industrialize your animal farming system. And the U.S. livestock system is already thoroughly industrialized. As has been mentioned, about 99% of our meat and dairy come from these concentrated animal feeding operations. Um, and in reaction, a lot of environmentalists have been making a push towards eating your food more locally. Um, uh, a lot of this was already covered previously today, uh, but uh, in 2008, uh, Matthew and Weber and Matthews did a study over at Carnegie Mellon that added up all of the emissions from the entire U.S. agricultural system. And what they found was that about 83% of all emissions come from the production of our food, with only about 11% coming from the transport. And out of that number, only 4% of the emissions actually came from taking our food from the producers to retailers. So while there may, may be benef many benefits of a local food economy, including uh, adding more money back into your local economy and building stronger social ties around our food, it seems that we need to be uh, making better choices about what we eat and not just where we're getting it from in order to impact our greenhouse gas or carbon footprint. And, but my biggest concern with deindustrializing our animal food system would be that free range meat is still incredibly costly in terms of greenhouse gases. So to walk you through this uh, figure from a study in 2012, the different columns are different sources of food and the height of those bars are the kilogram CO2 equivalents, to put that in layman's terms, it's just the amount of global warming uh, each kilogram of food contributes. And what you can see from my yellow highlights that I added to this figure is that grass-fed beef actually has a 50 to 350 percent more emissions than your feedlot beef. Part of this has to do with carbon uh, Part of the range in the amount of difference here, these error bars that you see, has to do with the specific type of grazing that's being managed. But the large difference, while this, I know that this may seem counterintuitive, the large difference has to do with two main things. First of all, in order to have pasture, pasture for your cattle to graze on, uh, in, some, in a lot of situations, you need to deforest or disrupt the natural ecosystem that's already there in order to let your cattle graze. And the second reason is that uh, Cattle's eat, cattle eating grass produce roughly four times the amount of methane that their industrialized counterparts uh, produce because these pasture cattle are eating a rough form of carbon that the bacteria in their stomach need to uh, ferment and break down, whereas feedlot cattle are eating these corn and soy macronutrient dense heavy foods that they can process and digest directly. So um, there are some trade-offs in terms of these two systems. And to just run you through them, to sum up in a really rough, uh, kind of an overarching way, uh, industrial CAFOs produce less tend to produce less pollution per animal than their free range or pastured counterparts. They could also, and while I know we've seen a lot of information today about the uh, administrative or legal barriers to getting these regulate, re on, regulated, on a physical basis, they're easier to regulate because they end up being point sources of, of pollution rather than diffuse sources of pollution. On the other hand, big negative trade-offs associated with these industrial CAFOs is that they're cheaper 
um, and therefore you can create more production as well as um, uh, potentially drive up the supply side of the economics and get your you know, population, uh, get your economy eating more meat. And by far there were situations for animals to be in. On the other hand, free range pastures, while they're more humane, can produce more pollution on a per animal basis, are incredibly land exhaustive as we've seen uh, in the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, they're, they're, in terms of scaling up those economies of free range pasture, can meet a lot of challenges for regulations as diffuse untargetable sources of pollution or harder to target sources of pollution and uh, they potentially can't meet the, the demand of already industrialized countries eating way more meat. And so with that, I thank you. So that was great. And before we take audi uh, questions from the audience, I, I have a question. And the obvious question is, what is the solution to the problem, the public health and the environmental problem? We've heard about the power of big agriculture, paralysis in Congress, statutory exemptions, and difficulties with regulatory enforcement. So do we need to just stop eating animals to send the message, or is there any regulatory reform that would help solve the problem? And maybe we'll start with Eric. Well, that's an easy question, so I'll... Um, <laughs> I guess it's clear that um, the less animal um, protein that we consume, um, the, depending on what animal protein you're consuming and what um, non-animal protein you're consuming, um, the less environmental impact you're likely to have. Um, I mean, that's the evidence. So the movement of the American public that we heard about earlier um, towards slightly reducing um, their meat consumption, over the long run, um, that's likely to have environmental benefits. I worry a lot about globally what the implications are of the skyrocketing consumption of uh, meat and poultry um, in China and India and elsewhere um, all over the world, what that's going to mean. But um, so I think that's part of it. I think clearly the environmental legislation needs to be fixed. There, we are working assiduously on trying to address a bunch of those exemptions or other ways to get around some of them. Um, and uh, you know what keeps me awake at night of all the things that I talked about is the antibiotic resistance issue. Um, because I really think that if we don't tackle that, as Bob was suggesting, we could lose antibiotics. And nobody in this room, I think, has ever lived in a, pre in a world without antibiotics. We all take them for granted. Um, but if we lose antibiotics, um, the world as we know it is going to be very different. So to me, that's sort of the, uh, the biggest most immediate crisis of everything we've talked about today. Clearly, global warming we've got to deal with um, and some of the other problems we need to deal with. So I do think that part of the solution is regulatory and part of it is really with people from this room and all over the country and frankly all over the world thinking about their diet and um, moving in the right direction. Do either of the other panelists have a, anything you want to add before we open it up? No? Well, I would just, uh, I said it a little bit, but I would just emphasize that um, in my experience and anecdotally, f I hear things from folks I work with at EPA, um, the CAFO permitting program that I was talking about is extremely hard to implement uh, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which um, are the results of these two circuit cases, circuit court cases, which limited the universe of CAFOs that are required under the Clean, Air, Clean Water Act to get permits. Um, and and it's, there's a lot of confusion out in the regulated community as well. There's a, a, a design standard that's supposed to be met for large CAFOs. Um, it's, it's referred to as the 25-year, 24-hour storm. So as long as a retention structure for the waste and process wastewater and precipitation and runoff um, could accommodate such a storm and prevent a release to a water of the United States. Um, any discharges that, discharges that may occur if that structure is, is um, at the facility are authorized if a permit's obtained. 
But many, many farms, I, I understand just from what I hear across the country, are refusing to get permits of any kind, A, because now the standard is um, they're not liable for violating the Clean Water Act until and unless someone actually sees a discharge into a water of the United States from their facility on a particular occasion, um, but also because they, we think, mistakenly have the notion that if they build one of those structures to the de design standard I mentioned, that they are therefore um, exempt from the requirement to get a permit, which is not true. So um, discharges that would occur at those facilities, even with such a structure, if no permit had been obtained, would be a violation of the Clean Water Act. Whereas um, if the facility has a permit and has constructed a retention structure to that design standard and a release then occurs because there's an overflow for legitimate reasons, um, there isn't liability for violating the Water Act. But so there's a lot of practical reasons why it seems that this EPA permitting program is a difficult, difficult one to implement and may not be getting the kind of um, water quality benefits that people had hoped. So, uh, yes? I have a question for Rafi, not on your choice of uh, various figures that are available for accountability for the Clean Water Act. To greenhouse gases, to uh, global warming. Uh, you, you went with the original, I gather, the original FAO estimate, which was... I actually, I already think I know where this is going. Do you, are you asking about the 51% number as opposed to the 18% figure? I'm asking about the range. The range, I saw, mm -hmm. I saw a figure in an article I read today from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, mm -hmm. which was 8%. And then, of course, uh, Anhang and uh, Goodland did a uh, recalculation of the FAO study yeah. uh, a few years later, about 2009, I believe. And they integrated several factors which they said the FAO had not sufficiently weighted. And one was animal res uh, respiration. It seems to me pretty obvious that that should be a factor. Uh, so uh, why, did you, why did you go with the 18%? So I went with the 18% figure because the FA, uh, the FAO uses the International Panel on uh, the International Panel on Climate Change's intergovernmental already established protocols versus Goodling and on uh, Goodland and Anhang made their protocol up specifically in terms of respiration. Counting animal respiration towards net climate violates a basic physical concept of conservation of matter, which is that you can't count the uh, carbon dioxide that animals breathe out without counting the carbon dioxide that they consumed, the carbon rather that they consumed that uh, are in the plants that those plants sucked up out of the air. So the reason that the 18% number I believe is the closest to accurate one, although there is some spread around that number, is because they were really diligent um, about and did due diligence about the amount of um, CO2 that the livestock sector is emitting while sticking to really well-established life cycle analysis to make sure that all of their emissions represented a net rather than gross contribution to the atmosphere. But I don't think it's realistic really to say there's necessarily an equilibrium between the amount of CO2 that's emitted by animals and that which is absorbed by plants, because if there were, I don't think we'd have a greenhouse gas problem to begin with. So we just have a flourishing ecosystem plant ecosystem. So I think that's too simplistic. So the reason that we have global warming is right now is because we're taking carbon dioxide that we've stored uh, underneath the Earth's surface for millions and millions of years and burning it up within a matter of decades. But close cycles of, and the reason that we have a uh, global warming problem with deforestation is because the uh, you're removing a forest within a span of uh, within a span of days that took uh, you know, 10 to 200 years to grow there. But you can't count plants that you only took a year to grow and within that same year have fed to animals. Um, I also have, well, I'll have to uh, agree with your concern with regards to uh, emissions. Um, and I'd like to just bring a clarification actually. So, um, so I agree with your, um, with the fact that um, if, deforestation has to occur for um, gra grass-fed livestock to be raised. Well, yes, in that case, of course, it's really detrimental for um, greenhouse gas emissions. But uh, I'll have to disagree with, your, uh, with the fact that you said that um, grass-fed livestock uh, is related to 50% to 350% more emissions. Actually, pasture-raised beef is 
much better in terms of emission because uh, the benefits provided by the livestock in terms of carbon sequestration to the land way overcomes um, the methane emissions. Um, so actually, manure, as you know, is a great fertilizer and um, pasture-raised beef is actually the way to overcome desertification, which itself is the largest cause of climate change, even more than uh, burning fossil fuels. Um, so yeah, so that's basically just the way to put carbon back into the soil because the fact that we've lost all that carbon from agricultural land uh, since the advent of agriculture is the, the largest cause of climate change. So I recommend watching Alan Savory's TED Talk. He came to uh, the law school a few months ago, so just to learn more about this, but thank you. Yeah, thanks for bringing up the point of carbon sequestration. It's definitely not a trivial um, uh, sequestration or mitigation of carbon dioxide emissions, but just to put it in perspective, the most generous estimates that I've seen are 20 to 25 percent for carbon sequestration, which uh, unfortunately doesn't overwhelm estimates of 50 to 350 percent emissions increases for, um, for additional methane and other uh, land degradation depending on where you're harvesting. The second or raising your animals. The second concern is that the carbon sequestration is not ubiquitous and highly dependent on the specific ecosystem you use. So um, we did, you did mention deforestation, but also there was a study in 2006 on grasslands in North Dakota alone that found even among short and tall prairie grasses, short prairie grasses, when you graze cattle on them using these conservation techniques, uh, remove or sequester about 24% additional carbon, but long and uh, medium height grasslands, actually you end up losing carbon uh, in those systems. So it all has to depend very specifically on the exact type of grassland that you're grazing on, and it's highly sensitive to a lot of different factors. Um, There's a question of, oh, I, I wanted to add, add to that. To that. Um, so we have a gentleman um, on our staff who I tease and call a PhD in grazingology. Um, but that's his, uh, Jonathan Gelbard, who's spent a lot of time um, on this issue. And um, I'll just throw in, uh, I mentioned this in one of my slides, that it was our, it makes a huge difference what the um, pasture, how the pasture um, is maintained. A poorly maintained pasture is actually really terrible. I mean, it, it releases all the carbon. Um, and his view is that there's basically, if you have, based on the studies he's reviewed, if you have sort of primo um, protection and grazing um, techniques, you can actually reduce the emissions, total greenhouse gas emissions, compared to poorly run ones um, quite a bit, 20 plus percent, but um, very few, if any, um, pasture-raised uh, cattle are being grazed that way um, because there's overgrazing and there's a lot of problems with how things are grazed. So it could be reduced, but in his view at least, um, you're not going to totally fix the problem that way. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, thank, thank you for both of your comments just there on elim illuminating some of the trade-offs that we need to think about as we think about a food system transition. Um, my one critique, Matthew, great talk. Um, my one overall big critique is if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about trade-offs, focusing on marginal impacts obscures the whole landscape picture. So if we're gonna put up there that um, pasture raised or pasture finishing operations have higher pollution and um, higher per unit impacts, and industrial operations have lower per unit impacts, a function of this system as a as a sort of a defining characteristic of the system is a scale economy, right? So in an industrialized operation, you have to have huge operations to make a profit, essentially. They're highly consolidated and concentrated in space. And so even if marginal impacts are lower, um, I'm actually working on this for my dissertation, so we should have a beer afterward, maybe. Um, uh, my hypothesis, and I think a lot of people are starting to think about this, is um, marginal impacts aren't all that matter. If you have these concentrated animals and the feed crops that are being grown in concentrated areas for them, you have higher eutrophication potential in aggregate, you have higher acidification potential in aggregate, um, and you may be uh, overwhelming the absorptive capacity of the environment at a local and regional um, context, sort of as a function of the, like as a property of the system, 
So it's just another thing to think about. Greenhouse gases are important, but um, it sort of bothers me when we focus solely on marginal greenhouse gas emissions and sort of forget the bigger in in um, you know in in um, preference over um, the the bigger environmental picture. Yeah. So I um, the language of the marginal impact versus uh, aggregate impact is that the the dichotomy that you're presenting here? Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. It's I mean it's an interesting one and it's why I mention uh, overall I think that uh, confined animal feeding operations are just altogether more efficient both in terms of their ability to kind of confine, potentially regulate, although we do none of that right now, um, pollution and in terms of emission on a per animal basis, but also in terms of driving up cost, profit, and overall um, productivity, um, as well as environmental outsourcing. So that's the trade-off that I, uh, the essential trade-off that I mean when I ask people to keep this in mind, um, but I'm not really, an economist and can contribute a lot to the conversation about what uh, making an economy of scale actually looks like. I will say, however, regarding in terms of the environmental issues of some of the externality and the outsourcing, that these are life cycle analysis that other people have done that I've pre been presenting, which tries to take into account all of the ex external or indirect co costs, such as uh, fertilizers, uh, uh, farm combine, uh, farming combine, transportation, and the rest. So, thanks. But yeah, but I, I want to completely agree with what you were saying. Um, I think one of the things that's really important, it is true that in some ways CAFOs are efficient. They're very efficient at generating huge amounts of pollution in a very concentrated fashion that is not disposed of properly. Um, so, you know, the, the basic problem is that although theoretically that could be regulated um, more easily than something that's spread in a diffuse way over hundreds of millions of acres. Um, in reality, um, just because of everything we've heard about today, um, they aren't regulated, basically. They're very poorly regulated. You've heard about the Court of Appeals decisions. So although in theory there might be a way that you could perhaps better regulate those emissions, um, the realities of uh, the American political system and global political system are that they just aren't. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we, we knew that um, Matt's presentation would be provocative, um, but, but I do hope that there are other questions that we can pose to Eric and to Greg about regulation. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I've heard about a specific impact of Greek yogurt, which is that the byproducts are a lot more acidic and potentially de detrimental. Um, a lot of these studies take, it's really hard to segregate between dairy and uh, beef because those industries are so incredibly intertwined. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Um. Hello? Okay, I'm going to switch the topic a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, specifically with global climate change, we, are, we know that we're seeing more severe weather patterns. We're seeing changes of that sort, which lead to flooding. Um, and then along with that, we're talking about the, the wastewater discharge and all those things that you mentioned. Um, so that leads to environmental impact. How is this being at all considered by regulating bodies? That there's obviously already a change in that. And, um, you know, we're seeing that those weather patterns, we're seeing more flooding, most, more of those issues. Is this being taken into account at all? with the future of some of the regulations? Uh, well, I know a little bit. I know that people are talking about it and starting to think about it, of course, and climate change is obviously uh, one of the most important things and the most frequently talked about things at EPA these days. Um, you know, you raise an interesting comment because, as I was saying, the design standard that's in the regulations is one that reflects um, being able to retain the impacts from a 25-year, 24-hour storm, and the definition of what that is obviously is going to change. Um, and uh, as big a problem as nutrient loadings are now to waters and the eutrophication problem, et cetera, that's spreading more widely, it obviously would seem to, you know, be worse, or will be. Seems it will be worse. 
Well, it's being looked at, but as you know, in the government, things that are looked at often don't happen as quickly as they are looked at. <laughs> It's a, it's a really good question, and I would say one of the classic examples of this is the FEMA flood maps, where a lot of, uh, in a lot of states, they haven't even updated the FEMA flood maps to consider climate change, um, and that's, you know, the direct immediate dollar and cents implications of that. But on, on the Clean Water Act side, very little attention that I know of is really being put into putting that into regulatory language. Yeah, back there. I want to know if um, NRDC or EPA are doing Meatless Mondays, and if not, um, when do you plan on starting? I didn't. Was the, second part? Uh, uh, the question was, are NRDC and or EPA implementing Meatless Mondays? And if not, when will you? <laughs> um, it's a really good question. Um, we have a lot of people that are implementing it on a personal basis. Um, and some, a large number of people are vegetarian on the staff. Um, we don't have an official Meatless Monday policy, but we are actually in discussions with Humane Society of the United States and others about um, looking into what we might be able to do with them jointly. Um, so I'll just leave it there. And I, I don't know anyone at EPA who's doing that. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna take two more questions. Uh, here. This is for Mr. Dane. Um, where are the CAFOs in Massachusetts? Or if you're not allowed to say that, how does the public find that out? Uh, well, you can call me and I can ask one of my colleagues if you really want to know. That's fine with me. I, I'm not sure that the information is available on our website. Um, it may be, but I doubt it. Because um, I had to dig myself within my own office to get these figures. and. You know, as I said, um, they're probably approximate at best. Um, uh, I don't know exactly where the alleged four large CAFOs are in Massachusetts. I'm only aware of the Suffolk Downs racetrack, which by definition is a CAFO. It's not a farm, but um, it's subject to the regulations. That's the only one I know. Um, I can say a word about this. Um, NRDC FOIA'd EPA for all of the CAFO data um, and the inventory. Um, jointly with Earth Justice, and um, it created a huge firestorm, um, which I'd be happy to talk to you about. Um, we ended up having huge fights on Capitol Hill about it because EPA allegedly released too much information to us, including um, details that they allegedly should not have released to us. We handed back a lot of the data, um, and it created um, a lot of backlash among the agricultural interests. Um, the EPA does have an inventory and does have a lot of this data in its files. And some states have actually posted them on their websites, so you can sort of dig around and find some of that on state websites. But in rare cases, is it immediately available to the public? One more. Yes. So just um, thinking about the discharge permits and the role that they play in regulating uh, animal operations. Uh, so I just know in the case of Iowa, for example, there are only about 3,400 operations that would qualify to get a discharge permit based on estimates. What about all the rest of, especially all the swine operations? What do you see as a role going forward for either the EPA or any regulatory body to deal with all the rest of it? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, there, um, the way the regulations are structured, and I have to talk about the regulations because that's the only jurisdiction, ju jurisdictional hook that we would have. Um, uh, CAFOs, by definition, have to get permits if they're large, which means they have a certain threshold. And um, if they're not discharging now and they choose not to get a permit, EPA has uh, a very weak hook to, to get them, um, to get a permit. Um, the medium-sized uh, farms only are required to get a permit if they actually discharge by definition already contained in the regs and that they're uh, situated uh, in relation to waters of the U.S. Uh, in a certain particular way. It's defined in the reg. I don't want to bore you with it. And then there are um, the possibility of smaller farms being designated as CAFOs such that they would have to get a permit is possible. 
Um, but then there's a laborious sort of detailed analysis that EPA would have to undertake for a site-specific location in order to make that designation. And with our lack of resources, I'm, I'm not terribly optimistic that that's going to happen very often. Um, so there are a lot of farms out there that aren't getting permits. Even ones that aren't required to get permits are not getting permits, of course, but even ones that are required to get permits aren't getting permits because they know that unless EPA can find them discharging on a particular day, they're unlikely to suffer any consequences. And then there's the question of if there's a discharge on Monday, even if it's seen, um, does that mean then that the CAFO has to get a permit after that that lasts every day into the future or not? Um, and people start fighting about that. So it sounds yeah. like we have to stop eating animals and do flyovers of the CAFOs to capture the evidence, right? So please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.